Please open your Bible to the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians as we continue this morning our verse-by-verse -verse exposition of this wonderful epistle under the general heading, Joy in Jesus. We began this series last week, so if you weren't here last week, take the time and opportunity to watch the video online so that you can keep up with the series as we progress each week through it. Joy in Jesus. The Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God inerrant in the original autographs. The Bible does not contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. Within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. So with your Bible open to Philippians chapter 1, let's pick up the text at the very first verse. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Over the decades, my wife and I have had the enormous privilege of traveling widely in many parts of the world. And sometimes it was necessary to spend many hours on very long flights during which we saw little apart from the inside of the aircraft and occasional glances at an in-flight movie that just happened to be playing. And while traveling halfway around the world by air does have the advantage that you are, you're able to arrive somewhere else very quickly, it also sadly means that you see little to nothing of the many wonderful and varied places over which the aircraft flies on the journey. And I was thinking about this recently when it occurred to me that this is almost exactly how many people today read their Bible. They read quite quickly through a chapter or portion of the Bible without taking the time to look at some of the amazing and remarkable truths that are contained within the individual verses. So look with me right now at verse 2 of this cha the first chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. It contains only 14 words and it only takes 4 seconds to read them out loud. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Only 14 words, and yet these 14 words are actually packed with glorious truth. And that's precisely why we're not going to simply read them and move on. We're going to invest time this morning to prayerfully ponder them, seeking the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the wonderful truths that are contained within them. And notice I didn't say we're going to take the time, I said we're going to invest the time. And the reason for that is because when you invest, you always expect to receive a return on your investment. And I truly believe that if we sincerely invest the time in careful consideration of these 14 words, the return on that investment will be of great value to us and can have a significant impact on our lives. The second verse of this epistle is what we call formally the salutation or the opening greeting. And as we look at it, it's undoubtedly in the form of a, a blessing or a prayer. It begins with the word grace. And there's no surprise to those of us who make it a, a regular habit to invest time daily in God's word because with the single exception of the epistle to the Romans, every epistle that Paul wrote begins and ends with grace. This constantly and consistently emphasizes that genuine Christian life begins with grace. Genuine Christian life is lived by grace. And genuine Christian life ends with grace. Not by reliance on self 
our accomplishments or our works. It's been said wisely, I believe, that grace is something like brackets or the bookends, if you like, of the epistle to the Philippians. And all the great and glorious theological truths are contained within these brackets. Let me explain. Paul begins with grace, and in verse 23 of chapter 4, he concludes with grace when he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace is probably one of the most used and yet misunderstood words in the entire language. In many different languages, in fact, around the world, the words of John Newton's great hymn, Amazing Grace, are sung by people who have absolutely no understanding or any experience of the amazing grace about which they sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We know from previous ministry series that the Greek word for grace is charis, and that means God's unmerited, undeserved favor and supernatural enabling and empowering for salvation and daily for sanctification. We could put it another way like this. We could say that grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. Grace is what every man needs, and grace is what no man can earn. And grace is what God alone can and does freely give. You see, grace addresses man's sin, while mercy addresses man's misery. The gift, and it is a gift, of grace makes men fit for salvation, miraculously making separated strangers into God's beloved sons. The great preacher D.L. Moody said, The law tells me how crooked I am. Grace comes along and straightens me out. Pastor Adrian Rogers said on one occasion, the best definition of grace he's ever heard is that God's grace is both the desire and the ability to do the will of God. Paul consistently and prayerfully desires grace for his fellow believers in Philippi. And that grace is a quality that is clearly obvious in the attitude that he adopted toward them. Ephesians 2 verse 8, you know it well, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But grace is also an activity which God graciously exerts for our help. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove in vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Grace is an accomplishment which God works in us and out from us. Acts chapter 4, verse 33, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And are you listening? Abundant grace was upon them all. Thinking about this and the consistency of Paul's prayers for grace for his fellow believers, it, it seems to me that we also ought to be praying for grace and peace for our fellow believers. Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a sense in which this was actually a, a fairly common greeting that was used during the time period when this epistle was written. Grace represented the Western or Greek greeting, and peace represented the Eastern or Hebrew greeting. And I believe the fact that the Holy Spirit led Paul to combine them together here, grace and peace, was so that we may be 
perfectly sure that he intended there used to be something much more than just a formal and normal, usual introduction. Both the writer and those who read his epistle would see deep and rich meaning in them. And it's interesting, isn't it, that grace and peace are always found in that order. It's never peace and grace. It's grace and peace, because grace is the foundation and peace is the result. If there is no grace, there cannot possibly be any peace. And so in considering this particular combination of words, Wilson Cash makes the in interesting suggestion that Paul combines the Jewish peace and Gentile grace in one salutation as a pledge of unity between the East and the West, between the Jew and the Gentile in one Savior who unites all into one fellowship, his body, the church. Paul uses these words in all of his church letters, demonstrating that he fervently and prayerfully desires for his converts everywhere that they may experience this grace to the fullest. The late Bishop Handley Mole described this as, quotes, love in action. So the order of the words in verse 2 is also very important. Grace comes before peace. It's only after we experience his rich grace in our lives that we also enjoy the peace that he alone can give. That means we have peace of heart because we have no condemnation before God. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That is a glorious truth from God's holy word. It also means we have peace of conscience because we have no controversy with God. But even more amazing is that we have peace of mind and no anxiety about the future. And if anything is needed these days, that's exactly what is needed. People look for peace of mind in pills, in psychotherapy, and all kinds of other things. But real peace of mind only comes when one is saved, is born again of the Spirit of God, is truly in Christ Jesus, and he indwells them by his Holy Spirit. We are the recipients of God's amazing grace and have and are experiencing God's perfect peace. All fear is removed and gone. The scripture says the peace of God reigns in our hearts through faith. I'm reminded of the words of the uh, hymn, is there a heart oh, bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing. All your anxiety, leave it there. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. There's never a burden that he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The source of these two wonderful blessings of grace and peace is clearly stated right here in the text of this verse to be from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We could express it another way and say that God the Father is the source from whom they come, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the medium through whom they come. And while at first glance this is a very simple statement, it's also in fact a very comprehensive statement because it means the truth that it expresses is complete. John, what in the world do you mean by that? Good question. We have just been seeing the glorious truths that we have peace of heart because we have no condemnation, peace of conscience because we have no controversy with God, and we have peace of mind and no anxiety about the future. These blessings are not nor can they be from the world, 
nor can they be from our circumstances, however affluent and pleasant they may possibly be. They cannot be from our own inner being, however much we strive, they can only come from him, through him, and in him. Why do I say that? Good question again. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, because the Bible says so. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. There's no question about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it goes on. And in him, you, as a believer, have been made complete, and he is the head over every ruler and authority. We may have kings, we may have presidents, but we have a king of kings and lord of lords who is over all. Hallelujah. Look again at the text for today. Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that little word from have any significance? Of course. There are no wasted words in God's holy word. That little word from is actually the preposition apo in Greek, which governs both objects. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who together form one and are therefore on a level of equality. So consistent with the rest of Holy Scripture, this has the effect of making this verse yet another definitive affirmation, are you listening, of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, the non-Christian religions and the false cults are proven by the text of Holy Scripture to be in error in their denial of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what I said about this text at the beginning this morning? Only 14 words, and yet they're packed with glorious truth. And that's precisely why we're not simply reading them and moving on. We're continuing to seek the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the wonderful truths they contain. The Lord Jesus Christ always was God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. And the Lord Jesus Christ always will be God. The great English cricketer, I know cricket's not an American sport, but it is in many parts of the world, C.T. Studd said, quote, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. End quote. Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Take special note of those words, from God our Father. It's not uncommon today to hear someone in the media quite confidently make a statement that goes something like this. After all, we're all God's children, aren't we? So we should treat each other as family. Wake up. We need to be very careful about this because there's also a well-known saying that if you repeat something a sufficient number of times, even if it's not true, people will believe it. So, let me ask you the question. Are we all God's children? Does it really matter what we believe about this? In fact, are there any consequences associated with what we believe? What does the Bible have to say about all of this? <laughs> and that last question, of course, is the single most important question. What God's Word has to say is what really matters. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by Him, that is God, all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And this verse makes it very clear that all people, therefore, are God's creation. The Bible also clearly states that God loved the entire world he had created, including the human beings, for God 
so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But this is where there is a distinction which comes in because not everyone, but only those who believe in him are born again and are true children of God. John 1, 11 through 13. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of blood nor of the desire or will of man, but born of God. In scripture, those who are not born again are never ever referred to as God's children. Let me expand on that just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. Among them too we all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, listen, by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. Because of the fact that with the single exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, all men born since the fall in the Garden of Eden are not born as God's children, they are born in sin, which separates them from God and aligns them with Satan as enemies of God. So the fact that those who are not born again are not children of God is also clearly stated in 1 John 3.10. Listen carefully. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. There's the clear distinction between the two. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Hold up a minute here. You having a hard time with your brother? Your brother in Christ? The Bible clearly teaches that we are not all children of God. The Bible teaches that there are those who are the children of God and there are those who are not the children of God. So this raises another question and it's an important one. How then can we become God's children? You become a child by being born. Becoming a child of God means you have to be born into God's family. That is born again. You have been born physically into a family somewhere, but now you need to be born again. And we become God's children through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which results in spiritual rebirth. Galatians chapter 3, 26 states it simply, and I couldn't state it any clearer. You are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand. I have much to learn, but simple statements like these, I believe even a child can understand. 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child born of him. So those who are saved are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus because God has predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. And this is precisely and exactly what the Bible teaches in the epistle to the Ephesians. Chapter 1 and verse 5. He, God, predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. <laughs> the thing is, though, we hear this phrase, God our Father, so often we can easily miss the profound meaning and implications of the phrase. If we are truly born again by the Holy Spirit of God, then God is called our Father because we are his children by the new birth. Remember the Lord Jesus taught his disciples, not the whole world, his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven. 
So it's not a, inappropriate or in fact irrelevant to ask you right now to consider very seriously if you really and truly are a child of God. Can you honestly and truly call him your father? And if not, this is, without any question or debate, the most important matter you need to deal with right away because your entire eternal destiny depends on it. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord. That word, kurios, is a very important word that describes the one, the one and only, who has absolute ownership, sovereign power, and authority. It's really interesting to discover that the Lord Jesus is referred to ten times as Savior in the New Testament. Did you get it? Ten times as Savior, but he's referred to as 700 times as Lord. And when the two are used together, Lord always precedes Savior. In fact, the same word kurios is used in 7,000 verses in the Old Testament. Usually it's translating the name Jehovah, which is interesting in itself, and perhaps something to discuss on another Sunday morning. God willing, we'll eventually be studying the second chapter of this great epistle, and we'll look closely then at the magnificent words that that contains. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. You can glance at it now. Therefore also God highly exalted him, that is Christ, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You know, we sometimes sing, perhaps even a little bit thoughtlessly and casually, He is Lord, He is Lord, He's risen from the grave, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But if Jesus Christ really is our Lord, we are to live under him consciously and continually submitting our wills to his will as his bondservants, always seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, not our own pleasure and joy and wealth and whatever. It's an important question, isn't it? Is he your Lord? We need to ask ourselves, every one of us, is Jesus Christ really my Lord? Do I get up every day acknowledging this is the day the Lord has made? Do I surrender my will to his will as I begin each day? Now let's be real, none of us have arrived in this area of Jesus as Lord in our lives. So it's precisely for this reason that Peter commands us to continually grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity, amen. That growth in grace and knowledge must be transformational, not simply intellectual. One of the extremely important aspects of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that in Scripture, he's also identified, are you listening, as the Prince of Peace. Peace is possible, not through the machinations of government or the wisdom of politicians. Peace is possible, and God has defined the terms by which peace is possible. 
Isaiah 9, 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government shall rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, are you listening? Prince of Peace. Paul clearly identifies the Lord Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace with God the Father leaving absolutely no doubt again that he considers Jesus to be fully divine. This is really important, isn't it? Because it counters the arguments of the skeptics who say, well, the Bible never says that Jesus was or is God. At the end of his earthly lifetime and just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus declared to his disciples, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the blood of his cross, binds together the sinner who was separated by human sin, but who puts his faith in the Lord Jesus and God making him a saint. And saints have now been justified by faith and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's later in this epistle, in chapter 4, in fact, in verses 6 through 7, that Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds, how? In Christ Jesus. The, the, the desire of the apostle is very clear here. He desires that those to whom he's writing may live in the enjoyment of both grace and peace. Everything is from God, and because grace has been given from God, peace is possible. The sum total, in fact, of God's activity toward his human creatures is found in that word grace. God has given himself to his people bountifully and mercifully in Christ. Nothing is deserved. Nothing can be achieved. The outworking of these benefits, both now and in the ages to come, is the product of God's redeeming grace. Peace flows out of that grace and both together flow from God our Father and were made effective in human history through the Lord Jesus Christ. Master, Redeemer, Savior of the world, wonderful counselor, bright morning star, lily of the valley, provider and friend. He was yesterday, he'll be tomorrow beginning and end. Jehovah, Messiah, mighty God and King, bread of life, lasting words of love that I sing, light and darkness, door to heaven, my home in the sky, the fountain of living water that never shall run dry. The angel called him Jesus, born of a virgin. Mary called him Jesus, but I call him Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He's risen from the grave and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is my Lord. Is he yours? <laughs> 